So let's go into our message for today. Uh, last week I started talking about against all odds and I'll complete it today. I read from Genesis, uh, sorry, John chapter 7 verse 1 to 9. John chapter 7 verse 1 to 9 and we saw um, what happened there. Uh, we, I'll just go very quickly and read that again just to refresh our memory. John chapter 7 verse 1 to 9. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tab uh, tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world, for even his brothers did not believe in him. Then Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but he hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. When he had said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. Amen? And then we see in th verse 37 to 39 of that same John chapter 7, it says that on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. All right. So we, we looked at uh, Jesus as the second man last week. I, I will just run through what I did last week and then I'll go towards uh, the remaining portion of the message. And what we said was that, um, you know, if you look at uh, uh, the writer of Romans in Romans chapter 5, he, he uh, argued that Jesus is uh, the second Adam, so to speak, because the first Adam failed. As sin came into the world by one person, even so, um, you know, many will become, as, as many were made sinners by one person, even so, many will become righteous by one person. So basically saying that Jesus was like God had to create a second man uh, perfect and sinless but this time he didn't he didn't have to do what he did in the Garden of Eden he came through a woman and you know we the Bible says that we are conceived in iniquity we are all sinners but by the grace of God you know God had a plan to redeem mankind and the only way to do that was for him to do it by himself because there's no way sinners can be you know uh, uh, can be redeemed without uh, uh, God himself doing it you needed 100% perfection and only God could do that Okay, so um, Jesus was every bit human and yet God. We have said that, and we also looked at his lineage. Jesus Christ came through a very messy lineage. There were people in Jesus' lineage, like Rahab. There were, like Manasseh. I mentioned these two people last week. Manasseh sacrificed his children. Uh, you know, in, uh, he, he passed them through the fire. He was a very wicked king. He reigned for 55 years, you know, over uh, 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 Judah. He was a very wicked king. And think about it for a moment, you know. Such a person was in the lineage of Jesus Christ. God God allowed that to happen so that you and I can, you know, you, you, nobody's above redemption. You can't, when you look at people today, you know, I just read a book recently by um, Jim Simbala. It was written a couple of years ago. The book uh, uh, chronicles the story of seven individuals that are close to him. He is a pastor of uh, the Brooklyn Tabernacle, uh, a very famous church. Uh, the, the choir has won uh, a, a couple Grammy Awards for how they sing. You should download their music. It's amazing. The Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. They have amazing music. It brings up, it fills your room with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And uh, he, he has written a book on prayer, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. That's an amazing book too. But what really amazed me about his, uh, this book is seven stories from people whom God has touched. Seven powerful stories. And I read that book. Actually, I ordered the book so that I can give them out as gifts for Christmas um, to people who will read them, read those stories. These are powerful stories of people who have been through stuff and how Jesus rescued them. It's called the rescue. Jesus met them where they were. Some of them were not even preached to. They were seeking a de deliverance. They were seeking help. One of them was actually in the, um, you know, uh, living on the street when he met with God. God moved mightily. In one of the apartments in the, in the building where he he was uh, the, the back street where he was living, uh, somebody began to play um, a, a message or something like that, and he heard that. That's how his journey began, you know. So, it, you know, it's, it's interesting to see how um, in the lineage of Jesus, there was all of these messy situations, yet, yet God's mercy brought Jesus through that. And that's why when you look at people today, when you look at our society today, now I talk to some people and they say, you know, people are not interested in the church. People are not interested in God. No, 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 no. People are very spiritual because our DNA is spiritual. We are very spiritual. But the, the thing is where we're looking for help. People are looking into different places. 
And that's why we must continue to preach the gospel. We must continue to preach the gospel. Sometimes you run out of options. You've invited people to church two, three times. <laughs> they don't come. Or they come once and they don't show up again. It's like, ah, they're not. And then you, you, we get discouraged. But if we hold on to the truth, I was driving to church today. I was, I was driving to church today. I said to my wife, you know, truth has a price. Do you agree with me? Truth has a price. If you stand for truth, and look at Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he paid the price for truth. The price for truth is a cross. And you have to carry it. If you decide in this church that we're going to pray and we're going to do the word of God, we're going to pay a price for it. Because not everybody will agree with that. Many people want the church to be a club, but the church is not designed to be a club. The church is designed to be a life-giving body. It's called the body of Christ. It's not a club. It's the body of Christ. It's meant to be life-giving. You know, many times on Sunday when we come together after the service, I noticed last Sunday, as soon as we were done, people were clapping. There's a reason why. It's the life you receive. The scripture says where two or three are gathered in his name, what happens? He is there in the midst of them. Hallelujah. So there's nothing that we face today that Jesus didn't already face in principle. Remember, we're talking about against all odds. And we are looking at the odds that Jesus had to overcome. We see that in the life of Jesus, he had grace. And it was the grace of God upon his life that helped him to overcome the odds. It was the grace of God in the life of Jesus. He had grace without measure. He was fully God and fully man. So when people say, well, you know, he was the son of God, that's why. Well, you are a child of God too. But he had to go through things. Remember, there was a time when the scripture says he was hungry. There was a time when the scripture tells us he got tired. There was a time when he was so tired he was sleeping in the boat. So he went through everything. There's no temptation that you are going through today that Jesus did not go through. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 to 15, we are told that he has passed through the heavens, that we do not have a high priest that does not understand what we are going through. In verse 16 of Hebrews 4, he says we should come boldly to the throne of grace. And a lot of times we don't come boldly to the throne of grace. We run to people. We run to, you know, we, we have a situation. We don't, we don't remember that there's something called the throne of grace, and we can come to the throne of grace. Something bad happens, and we give up. And we start saying the things. Maybe it's a test. Maybe it's a test. And we start giving up. You know, there's nothing that we face today. In Isaiah 53 verse 3, the Bible tell, tells us clearly that he was acquainted with grief. Acquainted with grief. I said that last week. So let's look at the, how his grace overcame the odds, and then we'll run to becoming a grace connector. But let's look at how his grace overcomes the odds, and how it will overcome the odds in our lives. We looked at it last week. I just want to mention this again so you get it, and let's let it, I said last week, if this is all you remember from the message, hold on to it. That's why I want to repeat it. The odds were stacked against Jesus, completely stacked against him. When he was born, King Herod said, kill any baby under the age of two. A license for killing babies was issued from the highest office of the land. How can you escape that? When all the FBI and the KGB and the Secret Service are looking for you, can you, can you hide? How do you hide a baby? I'm sure Jesus was not a baby that cried a lot. So they can smuggle him through the border. Because an angel said, take this baby and go to Egypt. Just run. See? From the very beginning, all through, he went through the wilderness. 40 days of fasting, the enemy came and bludgeoned him with all kinds of temptations. Then he comes out of the wilderness and he starts his ministry. The next thing you know, he's faced by the Pharisees who have been running a scam for a long time. So he comes into the temple and people are listening to him and they're all listening to the Pharisees. The offering is dropping on the side of the Pharisees. The offering is going up on the side of Jesus Christ. The crowds are dropping on the side of the Pharisees. The crowds are increasing on the side of Jesus Christ. I'm like, what is this man doing? So they begin to follow him everywhere. So they push him out of the temple. And his followers, we don't want you here. So he leaves the temple. The people follow him to the side of the, the, the seaside. 
They follow him to the mountainside. You see he's changing all his venues. There's nothing wrong with a church that doesn't have a building. You can grow too. You can keep going from place to place. Jesus went from place to place. All the odds were against him. He knew how to use circumstances. You know why Jesus went into the boat and he sat down there and preached to the crowds? The wind will blow his voice to the crowd. You see, he goes up the mountain and he sits down. The crowd comes around him and he ministers to them. He had different kinds of strategies because the architect of the world sent him and he is one. He's, Jesus was fully God and fully man. Think about it. The odds were stacked against him everywhere he went. Now, we've talked about the devil. We've talked about the Pharisees. We've talked about King Herod. How about his own family? The Bible says in John chapter 7 that even his brothers did not believe in him. Do you know one of the most painful things in a person's life is for your own family, your father, your mother, your sister, your brothers. Thank God for Mary who believed. Bible scholars say actually it seemed that Joseph had died before Jesus became an adult. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us so. But that's what people who have read the Bible more than myself say. So, but the point is, his brothers did not believe. They knew he worked miracles. They've seen him do things from, from home. They've seen him touch people. They've seen him touch people and heal them. But yet, they did not believe. That's why miracles is not a guarantee that people will believe. You can have a miracle going on here, and some people will still say, if God does not touch a heart, People are not going to believe. The odds were stacked against him. And then the final one I would, I, I, I would, me, I would mention is in John chapter 6, right? I've said that over and over and over again. God has used that to really teach me something. If Jesus could have the whole crowd leave, John chapter 6 verse 66, right? The Bible says from that time on, many of his disciples did not walk with him anymore. There was only the 12 remaining. In business, you call that person a failure. But in heaven, no, it's a process. In heaven, it's what? It's a process. And I told you last week that all those people who left, I asked you, what do you think they were doing? You think they went everywhere and said, oh, we had a wonderful time today. No, they left complaining. They left grumbling. They left grumbling. Look at this man. We asked him to multiply bread and fish because they remember what they ate the last time. And I told you that Jesus' burgers are the best you can ever eat. If you don't like eat fish that day, after Jesus broke the bread and the fish multiplied, you would eat fish. And you, so they were magnetic to the fish instead of Jesus Christ. The odds were stacked against him. People have agendas. They come to the church, but they have an agenda. They have an agenda. They're not interested in the message. They're not interested in what's going on. They're interested in how they can sell more cars. They're car dealers. So they look at you, oh, you need a car oh, I can sell to you. Oh, you. So they don't even listen to the message. While the message is going on, they're thinking of what they can gain. The odds were stacked against him because the crowd were people who followed him because of the miracles. They didn't follow him because of getting to know him better. They didn't follow him because so their lives can transform. They didn't follow him so they could pray. The disciples were the ones who said, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray. Luke chapter 11. That's why he was able to call them friends. You remember? I preached here a few weeks ago how Jesus was able to say, and I now call you friends. What do you want from church? Do you want a club? A community club? Or do you want a Jesus community? That is life-giving. That's why I say church attendance is very important. Very key. You have to make it a priority in your life. That I want to go. You see, if you're a child of a in a family, you love getting together. You know, our family, our children really love hanging out with us. I've come to discover that. Man, what? You know, they love to hang out with us. I'm sure your children too love to hang out with you. You know, yesterday at home, we were, you know, we've been battling illness. But thank God it's getting better. You know, this cold flu and everything, you know. And uh, I don't like taking medicine. Not that I'll throw up or gag or anything, but I just usually, if I'm not feeling well, I, I'll go and pray and sleep and, and uh, you know. But I have nothing against medicine. I take medicine, you know. So, but well, the last couple of days, we just, my wife and I were just battling. But the kids were very strong. They were running up and down. And uh, yesterday, you know, my son asked me to, that he wanted us to, to, to uh, um, 
uh, that we should re wrestle and roll on the carpet together. I said, my goodness, you are 18. You turned 18 just a few on the 5th of December. And I've told you I'm not doing that anymore with you because of how strong he is. <laughs> so, you know, I don't do, I don't wrestle with, I, I still do with uh, Philip. That's okay. But he's also getting so strong and it's just, uh, it doesn't make any sense. We love to get together. They love to hang out with us. I've, I've observed that. From when they were young, they would run into our room till today. I can tell you, I'm telling you, Faith is going to be 21 next year, but she comes on our bed and they just go like this. Because, <laughs> you know, the king size bed. And they will fly on the bed one after the other. We just, we just get out of the way because we don't want them to land on us. They are all athletes. We are not athletes. When well, my wife used to be one, you know. So, but you see what I'm saying? We, we love to hang out together. That is how it should be in the church. We love to hang out together. I remember when we were in Tabor Baptist. You remember those days in Tabor Baptist? How many of us were in Tabor? Way back. After service, you would chase people out of church. After prayer meeting, you have to ask people to leave. We finish prayer meeting and people are talking and talking and talking and talking and talking. You know, the enemy hates that. The church is marching forward against all odds. Against all odds, my friends. So the odds were stacked against Jesus. But what did he do? This is where we ended last week. What did Jesus do to turn things around? Because from all the crowd, he now had 12 of them remaining. People who had been healed. People who had been delivered of demons. People who had been blessed. People who had been married under him. People who had had children. People who had had... Because Jesus did so much that the Bible says the pages of the world could not contain the miracles. Guess what? Those people turned away because of bread and fish. What they will gain. And he turned to the twelve and said, will you go away? They said, no, we, we, where are we going? You are the one with the words of eternal life. So we move to chapter 7. I've told you, when you look at chapter 7, he moved to, to uh, where did he move to? He moved, right? John chapter 7. And verse 1, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. For he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. You see why the Jews sought to kill him? Not because he had taken people out of the temple. Not because he had more followers than they did. But it's even worse when people now leave and go and start talking rubbish. See, the man did not give us bread and fish to eat. He was, you see, you see, this is what we've been saying. Their own reason was because they lost a crowd in the temple. But the others have turned back. They now go. Haven't you felt, seen betrayals? When people start speaking against. But what happened? See here. Jesus did something interesting. In John chapter 7 verse 37 to 39. The Bible says, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. The same controversial message that caused people to turn and leave. They called it a controversy because they didn't have a revelation. Why they didn't have a revelation was because they were looking for bread and fish. If your eyes are focused on, <laughs> on food, which is, you know, which is important but it's not the most important, you lose out. So, he went again and declared the same thing. Friends, I want to tell you something. You may have a gift that has not been recognized. You may have an ability that people have discarded because you, people may have put you down for years. Let me tell you, you have a day of announcement, okay? You have a day of appointment, okay? You have a day of recognition. God has not forgotten you. God has not forgotten me. You know, the Bible says, and God remembered Anna. The Bible says, God remembered Joseph. The Bible says, God remembered this one, that one. God, it's not that God forgot. It's just that your time to come into the spotlight has not come. When your time comes, when your season comes, Joseph said to them, remember me when you get back to the palace, uh, to the, to the cup bearer. Remember me when you get back to Pharaoh's palace. Just mention my name and said, I came here. I'm innocent. I didn't do anything wrong. How do you feel when you have been serving the Lord? How do you feel when you have been tithing? How do you feel when you give your time? How do you feel when you have given everything and yet you get slammed down by the problems of life? You get slammed down by the things people say. You get slammed down by co-workers at work. You get slammed down by everything around you. Let me tell you, it's because you are a diamond and you have to go through the heat against all odds to become what God wants you to be. <laughs> I 
<laughs> Jesus did what you should do. He seized the grace of God. He seized the grace of God. That's the next point. <laughs> Seize the grace of God, my friend. Jesus knew that he had grace upon grace. Jesus wakes up early in the morning. You know that's Mark 135. And he will go to a solitary place and pray. And I believe that as he was there praying, he got strength again to say, yes, I'm going back. I'm going back. I'm going to do the very thing that I was sent to do. Because the plan of the enemy is to make sure that you don't fulfill your purpose on earth. One of the things we believe here at Joy Founding, actually our mission statement is that we are raising a people of prayer, purpose, and power. Say that with me. Prayer, purpose, power. When you pray, you, dis you discern, you will find, you will enter purpose. When you find purpose, you will find power. God does not release power for nothing. Power is meant to accomplish something. If power is given and the purpose is not known, it will be abused. And this applies to everything. Purpose in your marriage. Purpose in coming to this church. Purpose in the life of your children. Purpose, pur you have to find the purpose. And it's prayer that takes us to the place of purpose. Jesus stood where there was a lot of people. He knew his assignment was to save human souls. And he knew he was not to stop at 12. He knew he was not to stop at 12. So you know what he did? He went to where there was a crowd on the great day of the feast where everybody had gathered. And again, the same issue. I said, you eat my flesh and drink my blood. So he got there and said, oh, if you don't drink my blood, if you, sorry, if you come and drink from me, what will happen? Let's read it. He said, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Actually, on uh, verse 37. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. The people who thirsted before and came and left. I think at this point, Jesus would say, enough, I'm not doing anymore. And I know as you are seated here today, there are many of you who have said, I'm done. I can't do it anymore. But let me encourage you. Don't say you cannot. Because grace means God gives you power to do what you cannot do. Lift up your right hand and say with me, Heavenly Father, say it loud and clear. Heavenly Father, I believe that I have more grace than I would ever need. Your grace is more than sufficient for me to overcome. Hmm. He got up on the stage and did the same thing. The same message. Didn't change it. What the enemy wanted. What the Pharisee wanted is for him to stop saying, I am. I am. You see, I am. Only God can say, I am. If you say, I am. And there's heat on your life you will change the statement very quickly. Then you know I am not. If you are bragging and say, oh yeah, I can do this. And then a situation, you, no, 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 no. I, no, no, I can't. I, no, no, no. You change your language. But when God says I am, I am is eternal. You can't, you can't unseat him. He's the ever living God. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. The savior of the world. They want Jesus to get to a point where he can't say, I am. I am the way, not a way. I am the truth, not a truth. I am the life. The life. Seize the grace of God. I want you to know that you, can, you are to become, we are to become grace connectors. Grace connectors. Grace connectors. Now, I'm going to show you something uh, from Second Corinthians. Um, before that, let me just make a statement here. You know, see, the reason why you can become a, a, a grace connector, I have three of them. The first one is because you are winning against all odds. In Romans chapter 8, verse 37 to 39, the Bible clearly tells us there that no height, nor death, anything at all can separate us from the love of God. Let's read it together. Romans chapter 8, please. If you can put it up for us, I'd like us to read the scripture together. Romans chapter 8, verse 37 to 39. Do we have it up? Let's read it together, everybody. Let's go. 
Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when you say, why is this happening to me? Go there. Nothing can separate you. Now let's look at this, this other one. Because The second reason is because divine victories qualify you to communicate grace. It, you can become a grace connector because you have enjoyed divine victories in your life. It can qualify you to communicate grace. You know when people tell us, oh, their children are be behaving in a funny way, or they don't do this, or they don't know what to do with this child, we have a lot of stories. Because we have a child that is 20, we have one that is 17, uh, sorry, 18, we have one that is 12. And we've watched three of them. We've experienced certain things. And as a parent, you know, if you're a parent, you have children, you know what I'm talking about. We've had to pray for them. We've had times when our children were ill at night and we didn't know what to do. We've rushed them to the hospital. The doctors were not doing anything that was helping them. And we had to go on our knees and pray. We've been through situations and circumstances that, you know, I can share a bookload of stories with you. Because divine victories qualify you to communicate grace. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 to 4. I want us to read that one to 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 3 to 4. Let's go, everybody. 1, 2, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted of God. So the fire that is around you now, the fire from yesterday, the fire of tomorrow, is to give you such a, a, a degree of understanding that you are able to comfort those who go through those things themselves. It's not always fun, but it will be okay. All right, and uh, the last one. Because in him we live and move and have our being. Acts chapter 17, verse 28. The Bible says, in God we live, in Christ we live and move and have our being. You know, when you see me walking around, it is in him I live and move and have my being. When you see me sitting down, David said, in my down sitting and uprising, you have known me, Psalm 139. Whatever I'm doing, it is, in fact, the Bible said, do all things to the glory of God. When we breathe, it's because he lives in us. When we speak, it's because he's... We should come to the point where we know that everything about our lives, God is not over there like a spare tire. He has consumed us. He has taken... He, want, he does not want only one part of you. He wants all, 100%. And we must be yielded to him because in him we live and move and have our being. This is why you can be a great grace connector. This is why you can be a conduit of grace. One of the things we didn't have up as an uh, announcement is on the 15th of this month uh, to the 22nd, uh, an eight-day period, I would encourage you, uh, we will be sending texts to those who are registered. And if you, if you have a new number, please let us know. And if you want to receive those texts, we'll send a text every day with a scripture verse that has to do with the birth of Christ and a little blurb, a little, a little uh, description um, that goes with the scripture. And then um, each day we are trusting God that you will do an act of grace, seven acts of grace. Seven acts of grace within eight days. What that means is, I want you to look for someone. I want you to give someone something. I want you to write an email to somebody, a text to somebody. Count all those things as acts of grace. Some of them will be strangers. That you, For example, you are Tim Hortons and you have an extra change in your pocket. Don't take it home with you. Pay for somebody's coffee. When they say, why did you do that? You say, well, it's a season that we remember Christ. Use that as an opportunity to bless people. See, if 20 adults here do that, that will be meaning in seven days to eight days, we would reach 20 times seven. That's 140 people. You will plant a seed in 140 people. Now, if you look at your circumstances, you would not do it. But do you know that sometimes the way out of a difficult situation is giving. When we give of ourselves, when we give, somebody may have given you a gift card that is $10. You say, all right, I'm just going to buy a donut and a coffee for myself. I'll look around and I say, who can I bless in this store today? You do that. And you let them know that you are doing it because you are giving acts of grace as you remember Jesus. I'm telling you something. People may not get excited because of what you've said. But you know, the ground doesn't move when you plant a seed. Have you noticed that? You plant a seed in your garden, the ground doesn't shift. The ground remains there. But the, shift, the seed at a point in time comes up and grows into a plant. You know, you don't know which seed will prosper. You have to sow the seed. So this acts of grace, we want to do it towards people 
who are strangers, friends, family members, as well as co-workers. People who are not even expecting anything. You know, during Christmas, what do we do? Most of us just huddle around the Christmas tree with our family and we open presents. Great. But what if we thought of somebody that was not a part of our family? You, I'm not talking you have to do anything expensive. Just very simple things that communicate the grace of God. That you, you are not doing it because the person deserves it. Because if I don't know you and I pay for your coffee and your donut, I'm not doing it because of anything. I'm not doing it because you did something for me yesterday. I'm only extending the grace of God to you. Friends, so on the 15th, we'll start sending those messages uh, all the way to the 22nd. Uh, each, each morning you get a text. It'll take you five minutes to read it and a little, you know, explanation. And then when you do an act of grace, there'll be something on the website there, Joy Found website, where you can write in what happened. We want to share those stories. I know some of you are good at doing that. Others don't, don't want to do that. But look, if we are a family, let's get involved. Let's get involved. Let's do things. Let's encourage one another. I would write mine. When I do something out there and people engage, I engage people in conversation, I'm going to write and say, oh, this is what happened with Acts of Grace to me. You know, um, last time, I think we did Bible reading one. I don't know what we did, but uh, somebody shared an interesting story. I think it was you, right? About you went to this place and uh, uh, a certain park and then a restaurant where they gave you guys favor. We were preaching favor. And they gave you guys a, a very big, uh, you put that on our Facebook page. That was interesting. Um, you know, and you asked how much it was. And she said, uh, you seem like very nice people. And she gave you that for free. And that was when we were preaching about favor. You know, when you hear the word of God, the word of God is prophetic. When you hear it and you believe it and you hold on to it, you'll be amazed at how God uses those words to open doors for you. Our coming to church is not for nothing. Our coming to church is not for, if we're going through things and we just say, well, you know, I think it's time to drop it off. The Bible says that, uh, you know, uh, then, then why our, strength is, our strength is small. God wants our strength to be so strong and God will not graduate us until we overcome the level where we are. Until we overcome that level, God will not graduate us to the next level. So be encouraged because, you see, Job went through the things he went through. I don't think any of us have gone through what Job went through. I don't think any of us have actually gone to the cross to be, and some of us get um, offended and the reason is maybe our personal pride. Maybe we feel, oh, you know, uh, you know, why, why, why me? But everything you are going through today, everything I'm going through, that's what God has taught me and I'm sharing with you. Jesus went through it. Against all odds, he overcame. And friends, I want you to understand that against all odds, something happening in our life today, something in the life of this church right now is going to be history one day. We'll look back and go, wow, how did we get here? By the grace of God. Let's pray together this morning.